Welcome to the Simply Smart Business Show with me, Gemma Went. And welcome to the show. Now, this show is a part two. Um, this is a follow-on from my uh, my show last week on the differences between mindset and mental health, which is something that I feel really strongly about. And I've been chatting to uh, a lady in my peer-led mastermind about because she has the same feelings as me. She feels very strongly about this. So I'm delighted she's come to join me on the show. But before I before I introduce her, I just want to give a little bit of um, an introduction to Rebecca. So Rebecca Chass is a licensed marriage and family therapist and she's the owner of Potentia Family Therapy, an integrated mental health practice and she's also an entrepreneur. Now her focus right now is working with business leaders and those in their communities and helping them to navigate their struggles and roadblocks and overwhelm, all of the things we feel to help them show up with um, integrity and health and live a more of an integrated life. Rebecca, my lovely, welcome. And thank you for joining me as a part two of um, the podcast, which obviously um, you've listened to and we've, we've jammed about and we've chatted about and we've had a few kind of twos and fro's on this. My, <laughs> yeah. first thing that I would la- my first thing that I would love you to, to just share with people are your, your thoughts on that first podcast and any kind oh. of insights that you have to share on that. Yeah, thank you, Gemma. Um, Gosh, I have many thoughts. uh, But I think the first thought was being over the moon that you are talking about this topic. Because as a mental health clinician, and also an entrepreneur, I see sometimes how the two are addressed um, in ways that I delight in, in ways that are a little um, concerning. But I also see how they're interchangeable and in many ways inextricably connected, like concentric circles and that they have their own unique lanes, as you referenced in your podcast. And so I was deeply moved by your respect and appreciation for these different lanes and different approaches. And of course, love connecting with leaders who have this perspective. So um, I think just naming it uh, was pretty profound. And it was really helpful, even as you were sharing some of the feedback that you received from that first podcast too, the validation Um, about struggle and that sometimes mindset pushes through the need to convalesce professional falls and failures, the need to grieve, the need to forgive. Um, And with mental health, what I've learned as I've been interviewing and working with various business leaders over the last year and change, that sometimes mental health is seen as just a brain chemistry component. And that's a significant component. It's also family of origin. It's also trauma. It's also personality and temperament and attachment experiences with early caregivers. It's also how the brain and the body are connected. And and so I see often when someone is healing from some deep soul pain, there's a shift to more, who am I and what do I believe about myself? And also when people are white knuckling deeper pain, they try and heal that with mindset. And I think that's where I've seen, especially in work, if I get the perfect business, if I make a million dollars or even, you know, six figures of any kind, then I will feel better. And Mm -hmm. to understand that um, we can't think our way through struggle solely. And I, and so that's where I see the two connecting and, being aware of both emotions and the beliefs we hold on to and having a deep respect for both. So that's kind of where my brain started spinning after that first podcast. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. So much in that I love and agree (laughs) with. And for me, it feels like sometimes when you're dealing with this mindset stuff that you're putting a Band-Aid over a much deeper crack that the Band-Aid is never going to fix it until you start dealing with that stuff that is much, much deeper and causing these problems. I'd love, to, I'd love to explore with you a little bit about how you feel the two are linked a little bit mm-hmm. more. Okay. So obviously if mindset is, and, and I draw a lot on Carol Dweck's uh, research. She's a researcher out of Stanford 
and wrote a book on mindset. And edu- it's more in the education realm. And I know that there's been other books in the business realm discussed. And she talks about fixed mindset and growth mindset, right? Um, and so, but I think at the core, if we're attacking, what do I believe about myself? What are the blocks and the barriers I have about maybe, and you and I are talking about this too, like reaching or surpassing income goals or putting ourselves out there. Mm. If there are parts of our story that are feeling unsafe about pursuing those things, and we try to just push it through by working solely on mindset, we could activate a deeper trauma and trigger and bring something from the past to the present. Um, So there's that linkage there too. And with mental health, sometimes what's so beautiful is when I, when someone comes out of a deeper, a season, a, a season of deep soul healing, then like, okay, where am I without these codependent relationships or the drugs or the alcohol or the shopping or the numbing of any kind? Who am I without it? And that's a beautiful shift to start mm. to go, okay, I have some space. And where I see sometimes with both in both fields, there's this sense of, I've worked on that. I should be done with that by now. And we are, a per- we are yeah. complex individuals. And really, it's layers. And so when we have mindset blocks, to me, that's often I get curious and I'm encouraging other business leaders to get curious with those that they serve and in their own lives, get curious about that block, about that numbing out, that protective part. As I've shared with you, you know, I hear a lot about resistance in mindset work. And to me, I see that as protection and I had deep respect for it. So, so again, I see there when there's a block with moving forward and you see someone stuck or you're feeling struck, stuck in an area, it usually is connected to something in your story that's feeling like shut down and protected. And it's good to get curious about that. And then who you work with, and that's where the lane part, you know, which lane do you do that in? It, it can vary because there's so many ways to heal. Um, but that usually that stuckness is a sign of something inside it saying, this isn't safe to go forward. And if we try and push it through with both arenas, mental health or uh, mindset, we could be doing more harm. So I don't know if that answers that question on the linkage, but I feel, and also too, when there's a lot spinning around in my worth or if I'm coming out of something, and I said this already, something deep, doing some work on my worthiness, on on detaching my worthiness with my actions and the outcomes of things in relationships or work, that is powerful, crucial stuff to always circle back in. And because we're dynamic beings, we are not static so we hit developmental stages, we get older, we get married, we have kids, we have loss, we have job changes, we have tragedies, we change. And so we have these expectations in both arenas to not struggle anymore. And what I'm committed to is helping leaders like you can scale the message that falls and failures are a part of it. And how do yeah. we want to rise from that? That's a part of doing anything showing. If you dare to love, you dare to care, there's going to be a place of falling. And then what are the resources and ways to heal? And having a little bit more of an open mind because with mental health, at least in the States, I'm trying to remember from my days living in Europe, I feel like there's a similar too. There's still significant stigma. Like yeah, my, there is. My, my business leader colleague friends will be like, sure, I'll talk about perfectionism. Oh, I'll talk about anxiety and I'll be, I, my dance with depression. But abuse, trauma, neglect from parents, and I'm talking about the kind of neglect that you may have been blessed with great resources, but you had parents that didn't show up for you emotionally um, to yeah. some of the deeper, darker things. And so that stigma around sharing that part of your story, we have to decrease it because the statistics are still significant on those who are holding serious pain around anxiety, depression, um, the effects of trauma, the suicide thoughts, um, mm-hmm. the divorce rates, and all of those things. And again, it's not, it, it, it's just keeping those things in silence. So sometimes I feel like mindset's safer to attack. Yeah. 
And also sometimes mindset is like, I need to freaking take a break of all this deep soul work and just focus mm. on this lane and have some success. <laughs> and, you know, I need to tap out of trying to heal, you know? And I think, so that's where I like the lanes of being able, and I think it's a fluid yeah. lifelong experience. So does that help? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Because, you know, what I wanted to kind of jump in and talk to you about next is, um, is how we spot what we need to deal with. Like, how do we tell if it is a mindset thing we need to work on? And we, you know, we don't want to jump in. We just want to work on this mindset stuff. Or how do we tell if it's something deeper that does need that lane? <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> that's I not that. one, right? Well, again, I have the curse of being a therapist. And so yeah. there's this lens that I do see things in, and it's a both and. Um, I yeah. guess we talk in my field, uh, the mental health field, about trauma-informed therapies. A lot of the approaches to healing are not, and there's this big movement on what it means to be a trauma-informed therapist. And what I'm working on is helping business leaders be trauma-informed. And that language may seem a little severe um, or strong, and I may tweak that a little bit. And, um, but really, it is when resistance, seeing resistance not as something that always has to be pushed through aggressively. Yeah. Seeing resistance and getting curious about it with those that you're working on with, or you're working with or with yourself. Um, respecting struggle and pace are all important things. Um, and with any great breakthrough, there's often cleanup that needs to happen. So that's why the yeah. pace is really important. So in terms of identifying, I think it's just kind of saying, encouraging with self and others, just doing that regular check-in, this honest check-in, what's going on with me right now? What am I noticing in my body? Having a respect, not just for the beliefs and the thoughts that we have, but what's, how am I showing up? Where am I numbing more? Um, am I feeling disconnected from my body? And that's actually one of the biggest clues that I have with people when they're not embodied do not move forward. It's kind of with trauma informed. If you're checking with a the client, they're like, man, I'm just feeling kind of, I don't know, in my body. That's a time not to go break through. And so we talk in neuroscience, we kind of talk about when anxiety and depression are healing. And so if someone is really amped up, anxiety, often in my field, we've been trained to help people connect with their body. But when you see, which is not helpful, it makes it worse. So when someone's really top level anxious, one of the first things that you can model is compassion. Wow, mm -hmm. you're in it. That sucks. And not mm -hmm. trying to get them to do anything, but show compassion and help them model that language so they can have self-compassion when they're frustrated with their spinning. So I think yeah. that, and if you see someone who has just become almost catatonic, shut down, you know, that look where you like, they left the room, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, um, or you, yeah. you hear it in someone's voice, that's where you want someone to start like, hey, let's just get up and walk around for a moment. Can you get mm -hmm. up? Let's look around the room, name a few things. You want to help them. So those are just some things to do um, to recognize it. I feel like because as humans, we are mind, body, emotion, relation, soul, uh, in spirit, it's not that we're not separating. Yeah. We like to do that. So I think part of it is just recognizing the resistance and the pace of the questions that a lot of folks do with mindset shifts. Um, mm. Sometimes that ups the anxiety, which is part of it, right? When you keep getting those great yeah. questions and you're like, oh, yeah. and you wrestle with it. And then just encouraging those, hey, we're going to dig in. If you need to tap out, you give permission and mm. then you circle back. And, yeah. and I think sometimes that pace of it, because we get a big dopamine hit when we have that catharsis aha, and we have the love and the focus of someone helping us work through something that is game changing. Yeah. Um, but there's echoes after every one of those experiences. And so we have a responsibility to say, and if these things come up in your life, here are some resources. Um, yeah. from the mindset perspective and from the mental health perspective. And I think from both, actually, it, it's just making sure we're not the ones on point for someone else's change. And that's just a boundary okay. issue. It's so slippery slope 
um, to go there yeah. sometimes because we get so we care a lot and we're so invested in that. Yeah. And that's kind of yeah. where I end and you begin. And so those are helpful things too. So I kind of went a couple yeah. different ways with that question. But yeah. Oh, I love know. that. No, I got that. Do you know what really um, rings true for me in that? And this is from my own experience of dealing with stuff, mindset and, and deeper stuff um, and working with my own clients is when I learned that I needed that space sometimes to take a step back and just stop because I always felt like I needed to be pushing. And this is my, this is no one's telling me this. This was me mm -hmm. needing to be pushing through forward needed to be dealing with this needing to be solving this mm -hmm. um and it was only you know it's really i think in the in the last sort of year that i've given myself permission and felt like no i can't i can't physically i can't move forward i need to stop and create this space and just feel into it and and it has a great effect on me and when I can do that and I've noticed that with clients as well and I've suggested that like you know what just stop and step away and take some time and and just think about it and think what think about what's going on for you because I think that space is really important just stopping um, and stopping pushing on through and I I love that I love and that it really helps me. thank you for saying that and I actually permission especially from someone you've invited it to speak into your life, that is a gift mm -hmm. that we can give to ourselves and those that are in our circle of influence. And I also respectfully say stopping isn't really stopping. It is still work mm -hmm. for yeah. me. And I suspect yeah. for you, the actual pause is more excruciating than trying to think myself and, you know, work myself through something. That's actually where the magic can happen. Stopping isn't really stopping. In fact, that is work in itself. That is, mm. it, it takes more effort for me to pause and feel and really assess what's going on than it is to keep trying to do something and look at the shiny sparkly and, you know, get off my focus with work or with my family. And so that permission is a superpower gift and a part of the work if we pause. So it's not quitting. It's not, I'm doing air quotes. It's not quitting. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's not failure. But I still have parts of me that really are like, no, I'm going to kick this thing down. I'm going to figure it out. And I'm going to tell the world, I got it. I'm good. And yeah. I have to have the space to rumble with those different parts of me. Because if my system does not feel safe moving forward, it will continue to push back until I lose my choices. And I see that time and again with myself and with those that I work with, with friends, with colleagues, that permission to pause, which is an immense amount of work, is crucial because mm -hmm. if we're not listening to those protective parts, our body will shut us down. The body mm -hmm. will always win, as Besser van der Kolk said in his book, The Body Keeps Score, which I recommend everybody read. It's written like a novel and it's brilliant about trauma. I think business leaders need to read The Body Keeps Score to be trauma informed. Um, that our bodies win. So when you see or experience this kind of, oh my gosh, this chronic health stuff, it's because it's we're not pausing and we're not giving ourselves permission. And for leaders like you to say, this is a part of the work. So we're going to pause and you're going to rumble and then you're going to notice and get curious and then circle back. Beautiful. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, let's talk about the risks if this stuff is <laughs> handled wrongly. So what, what are, are the risks? Okay. Um, there's a, a couple areas uh, of risk. Um, I mean, the ethics of my field, re you know, require do no harm, right? Um, but when it comes, to, we can have breaches of relationships with others. Um, we can, with ourselves, um, mm -hmm. we can unintentionally um, unpack some pain um, that is bigger than us. And I mean, that's like kind of the worst case scenario that someone goes to a place where their system's like, you know what, the only safe thing right now feels like I don't want to live. So that's the, heart, you know, the extreme part of it. Um, we could have a, a, 
Yeah. You, could have, yeah. you could have your clients yeah. step out and you can have attrition in your communities um, because there's breaches in trust or self-trust. Um, and, you know, I think the bigger harm is we may unintentionally perpetuate some stigmas around struggle and around mental health and about different ways of growth and change. Yeah, it's fascinating. So with that in mind then, because, you know, there, there obviously are risks, and I'm, I'm really aware of the risks, which is what prompted my podcast in the, in the first place. With all of that in mind, then, is there a place for mindset work? Absolutely. Mindset always, mm. always. Mindset work is often the gateway yeah. to deeper soul work that impacts mindset work. And yeah. mindset work is often needed after deeper soul work, as I've referenced. And, and so, yes, um, you know, to be trauma-informed, like I've said you know, throughout this, we don't want to do harm and we get to circle back. And it's okay if mindset work leads to a crisis. Sometimes that crisis is needed and our job is to go, what's okay? What's not okay? What are, what, what's my role in this? And where do I need to have additional resources? But all, yes. I th- there always is. And health attracts health. And it's easier if we have someone saying, here's a three-point plan and everything will be great. I see that with the diet community, right? You know, yeah, if, you yeah. just, if you just never eat anything that tastes good again, all will be well. No, I'm being facetious there. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we, we do that. And so, yeah, I, I think it's a non-negotiable because – if we're showing up in our life and we have parts of ourselves that are still holding beliefs that we're not worthy of love, of belonging, of success, of connection, of community, or we have something important to say, yes. And sometimes mindset work will, again, like I said, be the gateway to some deeper soul work so those parts can unburden those beliefs. And that's why I talk about unburdening. I've been greatly influenced not only by Brene Brown's shame resilience theory I work very closely with her organization and do workshops on that, but also by internal family systems. And so yes. when I talk about these burdens, it's been so beautiful to see our systems holding burdens. And sometimes the, we can't, we all have these intellectual protector parts that like to think it and analyze it through. And we forget to get curious about those parts that are holding those beliefs that are very painful and feel difficult emotion. And I feel like if we have more leaders like you that are comfortable with naming and feeling difficult emotion, um, mm-hmm. then it's less scary when they pop up. And so I feel like mindset work is, is emotions are not bad. <laughs> if we can add that to, yeah. to it, you know, and that the past will act itself out in the present if we don't mm-hmm. do that healing and be a part of our future. So yeah, I absolutely do. And I think lead, I do believe leadership uh, requires a constant, what we call a U-turn, a self-examination. Am I working harder than the people I'm serving? Is my worthiness getting caught up in the results of other people or myself? And we have to check mm. our own mindset in the process because we can only take those we're leading as far as we've taken ourselves in our own journey of healing. Yeah, God, that's really powerful. And I really believe that. I really mm-hmm. believe that you need to, you can't, really understand it until you've done that work yourself and you've been on that journey and you can you can resonate and it you can really connect with that um you mentioned internal family systems i would love you to unpack that a little bit and explain what that is because you and i have spoken a lot about it and it's something that i'm hugely interested in and i think it's <laughs> of major importance um uh, but it's it might be something that some of the listeners have only heard for the first time now so if you can just explain that a little bit absolutely it, it, it's a it, it, it's coming from the mental health arena. Um, a brilliant man uh, by the name of Richard Schwartz, uh, PhD, very focused on systems theory, discovered this approach and has mastered it over the last three to four decades, and have had the privilege of training in this and working with him and his colleagues. And it really is a non-pathologizing approach to change and to healing and to pain. So you know how like a lot of mindset work or even those like beautiful in- Instagram images of, you know, fear is not welcome here and, yeah. you know, goodbye shame, you know. Yeah. So th- 
because we talk about our system. So it's different aspects of our internal system. So just like if any of you have heard of a genogram or a family map, you know, we've got the generations of mm. family and different interactions. We actually, if you flip that on the inside, what his research, and we, I just trained on a neuroscience and trauma um, training with him and his, uh, his clinical researcher. And it was fascinating to see this work actually play out. And I know there's so many ways to heal and this isn't a shiny, sparkly new thing. It's been around for a while, but what I love about this is it's, it really helps. It forces us to take a look at what are our protectors? So we have these parts that are called managers or firefighters. So the manager would be like, um, our perfectionist, our workaholic, our people pleaser, our goofy, you know, get silly, our organizer, and they're not all bad. These, and that's the thing, all of these parts are welcome, but the firefighters are like the ones that are like self-harm, suicidal thoughts, purging, sex addiction, mm -hmm. drug addiction, but those parts also, they get shamed by society, but they come in um, when at the heart, these exiles, and these are the parts of us that hold our pains, our disappointments, our traumas, our fears, our shame. And so our managers, these protectors and firefighters internally, and I know this is all lingo and I'm working on making it less nerdy clinical lingo, but it is, it's just these parts are just trying to keep our, our function. They're all committed to helping us function in life. Mm -hmm. And the exiles, when they are unburdened and these protectors are unburdened of their pain, then they can relax. And then we, what happens is what, what this theory um, talks about is at the heart of this is the self or the soul. And the, the components of the self and the soul are confidence, calm, clarity, courage, connectedness, creativity, curiosity, and compassion. And we're not embodying all eight of those all the time. But when we have that, those feelings for those parts in our system, because if there's, if there's something in our story that's lighting us up, like I have a hard time, um, just had a little situation where there's a very judgy part of me. I have a judgy protector. I suspect I'm not the only one. <laughs> I've got a cluster of these judgy protectors. <laughs> when someone's always playing the victim, right? Yeah. And so when I've got someone saying, it's all poor me, poor me, I have this part is just like, really? Oh, really? You think that's bad? And so if I'm leading with my clients, with my colleagues, with my kids, like when my son is like, my Lego set fell down, it's the end of the world. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, Syria, son, Syria, let's talk about Syria. I get, you know, that's not helpful parenting, <laughs> even though it's true. <laughs> um, and I could probably say some other ones that are probably not good to be recorded. But <laughs> so when I'm aware of my judgy, I, I can connect with that judgy part and ask it to relax a little bit. And then, and then it, cause it knows me. So this, the, it goes really deep. And that's why I'm super committed to educating people on this process. I have actually got a mastermind pilot that I'll be launching, not this year, early next year. And then doing this in-person experience with teams or business colleagues to go and have that deeper healing. Because mm -hmm. if we're leading in this world right now, my gosh, just this week, what's happened? That's, that's parts led. And if leaders like you and many of the other people you and I both know that are wholehearted, mm. soul led people, that's where change happens. And so with mindset, um, what I'm learning is that resistance, that overwhelm, um, the roadblocks, those are just protectors. And if we befriend them and which I a lot of people are like, oh, you want me to befriend my anxiety? What is this crackpot on your podcast, Gemma? Like, what's going on? <laughs> um, but it feels, it, think about how you'd want to be treated. And mm -hmm. it really gives some interesting structure. So I, I, that's kind of what I've been working on is to really helping leader, business leaders map their internal influences and help those in their circle of influence map their internal influences I'll send you a link to share with your leaders, but the founder of this theory just did this beautiful and brilliant podcast with the one and the only Alanis Morissette. And so that I think is a great yeah. way to hear about this approach from like a beautiful um, artist who um, connected with Dr. Schwartz. And so I would encourage uh, yeah. folks to listen to that and I'll get that link to you too. So, so, and then with shame resilience, just really recognizing the role of shame and vulnerability and the power that that's needed to how we lead and love too. So the integrating of the two 
has been a game changer in my work. And um, I've seen some of this language really be transformative with the business leaders that I know and work with too. Yeah. And you know what, just from our conversations Hmm. and you explaining it to me and I've used this on myself Hmm. and I've, and, and it is transformative. It's, it's, it's huge because I've, you know, when I've come across my own resistance or an anxiety, I think I used it in, in a resistance. I was just really resisting something. And I've also used it in a case of anxiety and I've gone in and I've spoken to myself and with the anxiety part of me, I was saying, you know what? It's okay. I've got this. You don't have to feel anxious. I'm okay. And that really helped me. Um, and wow. just kind of understanding that, that those are, you know, just, just thinking that that's, that's a part of me that's protecting me for a reason. There's something that's happened in the past and that's what it's learned and treating it with that care changed everything about how I thought about what was going on. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this. I think this is going to be um, a really mm. big deal. And, and if more leaders learn about this and use it on themselves and use it to lead, I think that we're going to see an awful more positive change, certainly in our industry. Oh, that's the dream. Forward. That's the dream. Yeah. And, and just to talk about like the physics of internal family systems is you can't destroy a part. So we try and destroy these parts and we, it only leads to more pain. And that's where sometimes mm-hmm. mental health and mindset have gone awry. Um, and here's the trippy part. And this one I had, my system did not like this at first, but yeah. nothing can hurt you if you're not afraid of it internally. Like if someone's standing in front of you with a weapon, you're going to be afraid. I'm talking more about when fear comes up, when vulnerability comes up, when memories of the past, if we can lead with confidence and calm and compassion and clarity, my gosh, we're not getting hijacked and leading from those protective parts. That's a game changer. And so I just can't imagine looking at all types of leadership in our world right now, um, and, and actually Dick Schwartz is, um, he's done, he's spoken in front of the Dalai Lama and he, they've been doing a lot of work in the Middle East, uh, peace uh, talks with um, Israel and Palestine. So this work is transcending just mental health, um, but going even yeah. into those arenas too. Yeah. Oh, it's hugely important. Thank you so much for sharing that. I could go on and on and on, but I, I won't, I will stop now. What I want to do is thank you again, because that was amazing. And I'm, and I'm so delighted to share that with my audience. And I'm going to make sure I share this far and wide because I just want as many people as possible to, to hear this. Um, I want to say to everybody that if you want to find out more about Rebecca's work in this area, um, it's Rebecca Bass ching.com and i will put this in the show notes she the website is in development at the moment so if you go as soon as this podcast comes out just come back in a couple of weeks because i know she's adding a load of really really good content to it um so keep your eye on it and sign up for anything and she will be she mentioned before she will be um piloting her mastermind at some point is it later on this year it depends. It year? I, I'm depending. I might just do an invite only this year and then have a little bit more of an open offering next year. So um, I'll definitely keep you posted and you can share when that becomes something that's a public offering for sure. Yeah, I will do because I, I just think that's going to be hugely powerful. And I would love to, I'd love to put that out then for, for people to get involved in that. But thank you so much again for, um, for coming on, Rebecca. And thank you, Gemma. And thank you for your leadership, your wholehearted leadership and what you're doing. You are definitely making a huge difference on this planet. And I'm very grateful. I'm a better person because I know you. So thank you for your work. Thank you, my lovely. 